All glories to the assembled devotees, all glories to Sri Guru and Sri Goranga. Where is our... Shruti, where are you? Oh, where is your team? Okay, you assemble your team. There's a, um, a theme of topics to be discussed over the next set of Sundays, Sunday programs, and it was launched last week by Jagatananda Pandit. by uh, discussing the process of surrender. Sharanagati. Are any of you that are new that don't know what I'm talking about when I say Sharanagati? Okay. Okay. If 
you have one of those things, put it in a vibrate mode. So, sh sh um, a very important teaching in Bhagavad Gita. I'll speak to both of you. Very important. You know Bhagavad Gita, right? Sounds familiar. There's one right there. Look at that. Bhagavad Gita is a core ABC literature that explains the process of self-realization. The concluding teaching of Bhagavad Gita is found in the last chapter. Krishna says, I'll paraphrase, I've given so many teachings, so many principles to be considered and applied in life. They're all subordinate to one principle. And all of those principles are in pursuance of that one principle. And that one principle is, take shelter of me, surrender unto me, become my devotee, Krishna is saying. Surrender unto me, become my devotee. Whatever it is that you have, Offer that to me because it came from me. Just love. Share an exchange of love with me. In a mood of humble submission and love. So that's the topic. There are um, how to, how to effectively surrender unto the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Well, it helps to know who the Supreme Personality of God it is to surrender to him. And so he gives his teachings in Bhagavad Gita to explain who he is. He discloses himself. That's what scripture means in our Christian way of saying these things. It's revealed scripture. You've heard that term, revealed scripture. In revealed scripture, who is revealing? God is revealing or God is being revealed. In Bhagavad Gita, it's very unique, not just someone revealing God. God's revealing himself. He speaks, first person. So, he's giving some sense to Arjuna, and that means to us, the reader, one who's hearing the conversation between Krishna and Arjuna. Who is Krishna? What are the qualities in him that may inspire me to love him, to, to serve him, to surrender him, to make him my all and all, lover and beloved? So that's in Bhagavad Gita, and he concludes, surrender unto me, make me your all and all. Let us have a loving relationship with one another. And the, in the relationship, he's the supreme. And we're the tiny spark of the Supreme. We're subordinate to the Supreme. So, according to one of the very elevated literatures called Padma Purana, there are six elements or limbs or angas of surrender. And we're going to be discussing the first one. The first one is humility. Because how can you surrender if you're not humble? Who's going to surrender? Are you going to surrender? No, of course not. <laughs> I don't blame you because why surrender? I've got my freedom. I can do what I like. What's this surrender program anyways? So there's description this evening about surrender and they're going to sing a song and Namaruchi is going to project that song so you can sing along with the song. And that's why, hey, okay. Can you move this so she can have the...
Some of you are with my back to you, so please excuse my back. The rest of you, we're fine. Um, in the seven songs that Bhaktivinoda Thakur composed to describe the principle of humility, he writes in an autobiographical way about his early life. Because Bhaktivinoda Thakur um, was born in a very aristocratic family. From those of you that are from India, you will know what I mean when I say he, he went to school with the Tagore family and other such well-educated people of his time. And so he was, uh, um, he describes his birth in an aristocratic family and what it was like and it's in simple language and so much flattery and so much praise and so much wealth and so much abundance and he lived his life in luxury and now I'm at the end of my life and I still don't know who I am and it's too late. So woe is me. Oh my dear Lord, please help me. Then he goes back and another song describes further elaboration on how he, in summary, invested so much in illusory life. Now, at a later stage when he's thinking, it's all gone. And soon everything that seems to be here is also going to be gone. I was going to... Let me read. There's um, a song just before this one. Well, two songs just before this one. Those of you that know these songs, it's Amar Jivan. I couldn't hear you. I, um, would you like to give class or would you like me to give class? Can somebody help this gentleman? He's got a problem. Okay. Let me read the translation to um, song number four out of seven, where expressions of humility are what... Bhaktivinoda Thakur is describing. Listen, he's pouring out his heart. I am an impious sinner and I have caused others great anxiety and trouble. I have never hesitated to perform sinful acts for my own enjoyment. Devoid of all compassion, concerned only with my own selfish interests, I am remorseful seeing others happy. I am a perpetual liar, and the misery of others is a source of great pleasure for me. That's not how he really is. He's just describing the life of someone who's very unfortunate. The material desires within the core of my heart are unlimited. I am wrathful, devoted to false pride and arrogance, intoxicated by vanity, and bewildered by worldly affairs. Envy and egotism are the ornaments I wear. Ruined by laziness and sleep, I resist all pious deeds, yet I am very active and enthusiastic to perform wicked acts. For worldly fame and reputation, I engage in the practice of deceitfulness. Thus, I am destroyed by my own greed and am always lustful. A wicked, vile man such as this, rejected by godly people, is a constant offender. I am such a person, devoid of all good works, forever inclined toward evil, worn out and wasted by various miseries. Now in old age, deprived of all means of success, humbled and poor, Bhaktivinoda submits his tale of grief at the feet of the Supreme Lord. 
So, expressions of humility. Uh, as a Vaishnava, are fitting and quite natural. Um, some of you who are, are regulars, visitors, you may have heard one lecture. I'll just summarize one part. In Los Angeles, just like here, we have Kishore Kishori. And Prabhupada personally saw to the installation of these deities. So in Los Angeles, the deity's name is Rukmini Dwarkadish. Very beautiful deities. And during the installation ceremony, Prabhupada personally performed the Pran Pratishta. And then in the lecture, he was describing the mood with which one should worship the deity. And he spoke with such a mood of humility that he broke down and practically began to cry. He said, one should not think in a prideful way, oh, I have this wonderful service of worshipping the deity. Rather, Krishna, you are so kind. I have no qualification at all. And his voice trembled and choked up. He said, I'm rotten, I'm fallen, I'm puffed up. I have no qualification, but you are very merciful. Kindly accept whatever offering I am able to make to you. So, oh, humility. Um, there's a material kind of humility and a spiritual kind of humility. I'll make a little distinction here. This material kind of humility is something like low self-esteem. I'm worthless, I'm nothing, I'm garbage. And the spiritual kind of humility is, Krishna, you are so great, and I am so small. Before you, in a spiritual conception, I am insignificant. But you are everything, and one of your wonderful qualities is your mercy. Kindly engage me in your service. Spiritual conception of humility. In relation to the Supreme, we're very tiny. And in fact, we're very tiny. Not just the body. The body is however tall the body is, or big or wide or whatever. Strong or smart or the, op the opposite. The soul is so small, it's smaller than an atom. According to the Vedic statement, if you took one hair and just the very tip of the hair and divided the tip of the hair into 100 parts and took one of those 100 parts and divided that into 100 parts, that's the size of the atom. It's subatomic. And that same atom that animates the elephant is the, animate, the, uh, the uh, soul that's animating the human body that's animating a microbial germ. Same soul, but different states of consciousness. And in, when one is awarded the human form of life, very special in the um, cycle of birth and death, in the wheel of samsara, just like emona, durmati, samsara, Bhitore. Samsara means the wheel of birth and death. Samsara. From birth to death and then another changing of body to another, another, and another. Very lively evening tonight. Be quiet. Yeah. <laughs> so, the soul before Krishna is very tiny. That spiritual conception of humility. Let me tell you a story while this gentleman is making his way to the altar. 
Um, the story that I personally heard first was in New York, but a similar story actually was told in Los Angeles. There's a, a very early stage of our Hare Krishna movement. Uh, there was a storefront on 2nd Avenue, 26 2nd Avenue. And there was a, the first president of that center was a, dev, a big devotee, big in a number of ways. He was really physically big. Still is, really big. And his name was Brahmananda. So one, one morning, the, the devotees were going for a walk with Prabhupada in New York City, and Brahmananda turned to Prabhupada. There were several other devotees on the walk, and he said, Srila Prabhupada, I'm having a very difficult time being humble because I have so much service. I'm in charge of the, all the printing of the books and I'm in charge of the center and I'm in charge of this and that and spiritual sky and there were scented products, incense. I'm in charge of so many things. It, it, it's really hard to be humble. How do I maintain humility? So Prabhupada put his cane down on the sidewalk and said, in the spiritual sky, there are unlimited spiritual planets, the largest of which is Krishna Loka, where Krishna resides with Srimati Radharani and all of his loving associates in Vrindavan, Goloka Vrindavan. But the other spiritual planets, Vaikuntha planets, they're unlimited in number. In this vastness of the spiritual sky that knows no limit. In one corner of the spiritual sky, there is a field of material energy, like a cloud in the sky. And it's, that's called the Mahatattva. Within that vast spiritual, uh, Mahatattva, the cloud of the material energy, there's Garbhadakshayi Vishnu, oh, excuse me, Mahavishnu. Mahavishnu lies down within that field of the material energy and his body is so huge that from the pores of his skin as he exhales not perspiration but universes come out and the universes that come from the body of Mahavishnu are unlimited in number and in each of those universes one expansion of Mahavishnu comes in the form of Garbhadakshayi Vishnu and Garbhadakshai Vishnu generates Lord Brahma who creates all the planets within this universe. But there's unlimited Brahmas and unlimited universes. And out of all the unlimited planets in this universe, there's one planet called Earth Planet. And on that Earth Planet, there's seven continents, one of which is North America. And in North America, there's one country called the United States. And in the United States, there's one state called New York State. And in New York State, there's one city called New York City. And in New York City, there are so many streets. And we're now standing on one of those streets called Mott Street. And you're asking me how to become humble. <laughs> Simply think of Krishna. And in relation to Krishna, you're insignificant. What service you are doing that is so great in comparison to Krishna who gives all ability to do whatever service you do anyway. Just think of Krishna and you'll become humble. So that's the spiritual conception of humility. It's not the other material kind. Someone steps on you and we were discussing this today. You'd be a pacifist. The, the, the expression, Western expression is turn the other cheek you from America, you know what that one is. Someone slaps you, say, oh, hit me here now. Turn the other cheek. So that's, the, that's an, a, a kind of humility, but that's not what's spoken of in the process of surrender. It's recognize one kind of humility, one portion of that is, I've been given this human form of life and I've misused it. That's greatly unfortunate and I can't buy back even one moment of time that I've wasted. So how fruitless I have spent my life. Let me at least dedicate this remaining portion of my life, whatever that stage of life is when the light goes on, that says, let me take shelter 
of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Now, um, especially for both of you that don't know any of those Sanskrit words that we sang, the mind, emona dormati, mana, Sanskrit word means mind. Emona dur, dur means wicked. Emona dur mati, oh, wicked mind. Our mind carries us into circumstances of life because the mind conjures, let me enjoy this way, and we go this way. Let me enjoy that way, and we go that way. And that carries the soul in the wheel of birth and death. Let me enjoy this way, let me enjoy that way. So the material energy configures itself in such a way that we get a body to try to enjoy this way, that way, according to our desire, but also according to our karma. You know the meaning of karma, right? Yeah, karma. Okay. <clears throat> when I recognize, so it's 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 these two parts I'm emphasizing. When I recognize the misfortune of pursuing a mirage in the desert. It's pursuing happiness in a place where there is, it's not, de, it's not the design. There's difficulties at every step. So when I recognize there's something wrong with this picture, everyone wants to be happy, but they're finding unhappiness. Everyone wants to be loved, but there's so much misery in this world. Something wrong with this picture. Everyone wants to live forever and everyone has to die. And so on and so on. There's something wrong with this picture. Maybe I should change the channel. Maybe I need a sp an alternative, a spiritual alternative. And recognizing the supreme personality of Godhead, the supreme Lord, let me take shelter of him and be under his protection. I'm going to read a short, just a little paragraph here of... <clears throat> so, yeah, there, there's, there's a process that's especially recommended in this age for awakening that spiritual consciousness and diminishing the other kind. And that's the chanting of the holy name, just as she very nicely sang Hare Krishna Mantra at the end of the song. It's that, that chanting of the holy name that's found in all the revealed scriptures, the importance of hallowing or praising God's name is in all the revealed scriptures. Every scripture has its glorification like that. It's especially meant for this age. However, even when taking that very auspicious process of chanting the holy name, we may find that we're not attracted the mind is all over the place when we're chanting instead of absorbed in the chanting. So there was speaking of Lord Chaitanya in the song that he came to deliver and has delivered many that to, from this material to the spiritual position. He prays that the chanting of the holy name you can become absorbed if you develop the qualities of humility pridelessness of, of, of respect to others without any expectation of respect in return. In such, a, in such a state of mind, one can chant the holy name very happily, endlessly, and be very happy. So here's a little description written by Bhakti Minot Thakur about that quality of humility. Same one who wrote the song is describing the quality of humility. I am constitutionally an infinitesimal, very tiny, and eternal servant of the Lord, Sri Krishna. Thus I have no real need for material life, 
because I have estranged myself from the Lord, I find myself strapped to the wheel of birth and death. Birth and death. That do, 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 do. Strapped to the wheel of birth and death, suffering untold miseries. But now, by the grace of my Guru and all the Vaishnavas, I have come to realize that only by devotional service to the Supreme Lord can I find release from this dilemma and become reinstated in my original constitutional position and spiritual identity that leads to attainment of love of God. Therefore, as long as I am not freed by the Lord's mercy from the chains of material bondage to go through life, I must embrace the path of the Sanskrit as yukta vairagya, engaging what has been given to me by God in service to God, essentially. And together with knowledge of the relationship of all things to their source, to God. I should accept matter only enough for my bare necessities and just keep my body and spirit together. He, his emphasis is that with humility, spiritual conception of humility, there's a, one's life becomes simpler. The, the things that I think I need to, be, to make me happy just diminish naturally because there's a greater happiness within and you can say the opposite. When that greater happiness within is missing, I'm looking for some happiness. Maybe it's here, maybe it's there, maybe I get a bunch of these things and more and different varieties and that didn't work. I'll try some other thing and some other thing. And accumulation of things doesn't make one happy. But when one's happiness, it's natural because naturally we're happy. Spiritually, we're part of God who is supremely happy. Satchitananda vigraha, in fullness. And we're a tiny spark, so happiness is natural for us, we want. So when the spiritual conception is something that we receive and act from, then part of humility is a slackening of material attraction. Sometimes people ask, what, <clears throat> what's a sign like some little litmus so we test. We know huh? that we're making spiritual progress. What Bhakti Vinod Thakur teaches, very simple. Two things. Your material attractions are diminishing. And your eagerness to hear and chant topics about Krishna, the glories of Krishna, and being situated in some service to Krishna very happy because that happiness is there the other is diminishing that's spiritual progress very standard simple uh, and it doesn't it doesn't matter whether one is a renunciate or a householder it's, it's there in the next paragraph that he writes whatever your position live in the forest or live in a home live simply by enthusiastically and regularly engaging in the activities of glorification of the Supreme and hearing those glories. And, and that makes the heart pure, and in that pure state, naturally one becomes very humble. So what if somebody has a problem with being humble? What should you do? You can't fake it. What should, what should you do? I mean, you can try to fake it, but that doesn't work what to do. Bring oneself into the association of those who are humble and have a spiritual conception of humility and relish glorification of Krishna and chanting Krishna's holy name and engaging in different activities according to ability, some, some activity in service to Krishna. Associate with those persons. And that same quality will become yours. There's a verse, a little phrase from Bhagavad Gita. Sangat, sanjayate, kama, 
those of you that know Sanskrit. Sangha means association, and kama means desire. So those who you associate with, you develop qualities like them. Simple. Prabhupada was once asked, Swamiji, how do you become sincere? Prabhupada's answer, how do you become a drunkard? You go to a bar and a place where drinking goes on and just stay there for a while. You become a drunkard. How do you become a scholar? Associate with scholars. Enroll in a university and associate with scholarly people and you become scholarly. How do you become sincere? By associating with those that are sincere. You develop qualities like those with whom you associate. So part of the problem is persons that are, have a difficulty with being humble is they don't want to associate with people that are humble. They don't like being humble. They like associating with people that are rough and tumble instead of humble. But supposing somebody recognizes, I don't like that quality. I know it's not a nice quality. I'd like to be humble. That person, when associating with saintly persons or persons on a path of spiritual progress, trying also to become humble, that quality becomes your quality. I think I'll just end with just repeating something that I said earlier, and that is very important. Just like in Bhagavad Gita, the instruction, the, the question that Arjun asks in Bhagavad Gita is, what is my duty? So I'm paraphrasing here, but before Krishna goes into describing to Arjuna what is his duty, essentially he says, first you have to understand who you are before you can know what is your duty. So who are you? And he gives the spiritual conception, the eternal soul, not the, not the temporary body, it's not something that can be burned by fire or moistened by water or withered by the wind. Something that's beyond the material elements is the spiritual spark, the soul. That's who you are. Then you can have some sense of what your duty is. But you have to have a spiritual conception so same. Humility requires a spiritual conception. Where do you get a spiritual conception? They don't have them in Walmart and ShopRite. And where do you get spiritual conception? Where do you, where do you get it? It's in, it's in Bhagavad Gita. It's in Bhagavad Gita. And through the association of those who are living their lives according to those teachings, because that's where the teaching of what the spirit soul is and the spiritual conception and the qualities of humility. At least that's, that's the service, that's the responsibility of those that are living a life, not just living here in the temple, but so many householders living the life of devotion to Krishna should be perambulatory Bhagavad Gita's, walking around the world and showing by example, here's what the message of Bhagavad Gita is. That's your service to others who are wanting to become humble but struggling with, with it. Be an example. So that's, that's the life of devotion. Serving Krishna nicely as much as we can, receiving mercy from Him, being very grateful for that mercy that we receive and keeping a humble heart and trying to, by best means, showing by example how to, how to live a life in devotion to Krishna in a humble way. Bhaktisiddhanta's advice is, whatever you do, do that in a humble mood. It's directly in this um, commentary on these instructions of Lord Chaitanya. Whatever you do, do that in a humble mood of service to Krishna. Cultivate that as part of the process of surrender to Krishna. So, you're all very patient. Thank you for sitting and listening. Any comments or questions? Yes. You want to make a statement? 
You, you don't need a microphone. You're, you've got a loud voice. Powerful. About uh, chanting on the rods of beats. If a person is chanting on the rods of beats and they're saying, well, I'm going to do 15 rounds, and they're thinking about numbers. Okay, if they're chanting Hare Krishna on the rods of beats and they think about, oh, I'm, I'm going to think about stuff that I did last week or stuff that I'm going to do next month, month and their mind is wandering around. I what mean, to do? I mean, you know, what is that? Okay. I don't think that person is, is, I don't think that person is. They're not at the stage of perfection yet, that's for sure. Hand him the microphone. That's the beginning stage. That's the beginning stage where one doesn't have control of the mind. So your question is, what to do when you don't have control of the mind and you're supposed to be controlling the mind? You practice. Best to practice, bring the mind to that which will make the mind pure. And the supreme pure is the best for making the mind pure. So in that condition that you described, what should the person do? They should continue to chant, calling from their heart, my dear Lord Krishna, I know that my mind is all over the place and it's not with you. That's my condition. I'm disclosing my condition which you already know because you're in my heart, but that's my condition. Please help me, please pick me up from this dark place of an uncontrolled mind by your supreme compassion and purity. That's what one should do. Yes, Jai Jagannath. Maharaj, we are, we are often told that um, of all the qualities of a devotee, the quality of surrender is primary and all the qualities are secondary. And by, um, by that one quality of surrender to Krishna, then the devotee will become ornamented with all the other qualities. Um, I always found it interesting, as I was wanting insight on this point, that humility often makes it as a quality in the secondary category. Yeah. And we're often told just by surrendering to Krishna, that one quality you'll get ornamented with all the other ones, but humility also makes it in the list of surrendering to Krishna. So we're often told there's it's, no it's, necessity. It's an attribute. Surrender, humility is an attribute that assists. It's a limb of. You know, we have limbs. You know, most of us. Arms and legs, four of them. And our arms and legs assist us in the process of doing what bodies do. They assist us to get, a, you know, to the prashadam hall when it's prashadam time. <laughs> to come to the temple when it's arti time. To dance when it's dancing time. And to go see our friends who talk about Krishna when it's Krishna Kata time. But, the, you know, that's not the whole thing. That's part of what the body. It's a limb of the body. So in the process of surrender, there's a limb. Humility. And using that limb, just like these, in a proper way, it assists in the process of surrender. That's how I understand it, anyway. Acharya Nishta, you can... Uh, Gumaraj, you were describing difference between material and spiritual conception of humility. Yeah. In the prayers of Bhakti Vinod, like we were hearing, it sounds... My understanding is it's more of a material, like lamenting, wretched position. How do we make sense of a sp spiritual conception, but a fallen conception as well? Because, what's the goal? What's the difference between material and spiritual? How's that for a question? Simple definition, really simple. Spiritual, material means forgetfulness of Krishna. Spiritual means remembrance of Krishna. Wow, that was too simple. Can we do it more complicated? No, it's, it's that simple. Um, I'm spirit soul, not this body, nor the designations of the body. But if I, I can use the body in service to Krishna. I can use the designations of this body, sannyasi, brahmachari, grahasta. I can use these designations of body. I'm, I'm an artist, I'm a musician, I'm a bookkeeper, I'm a... It's not who we are. Those are material conceptions. 
but I can use those things in Krishna's service and they become spiritualized because there's remembrance of Krishna connected. So in these expressions of humility, he's feeling great remorse. That's, that's a, if you just stay in remorse, that's not spiritual. <laughs> but if it's an impetus to move to the proper position, then it becomes spiritualized. It has its utility. Spiritual position in remembrance of Krishna. Yes. Maharaj, you were saying that one of the elements of um, spiritual humility is understanding that I am very insignificant and Krishna is very grand. Yeah. Um, I was wondering what kind of attitude we can develop so that by the mercy of Guru and Krishna we get that understanding. Because well, it seems about our what quality should we develop? Is that what your question? What attitude should we have? Attitude because should we have. Because on our own, we probably can't Submissive get Submissive and eager hearing. Um, once Prabhupada said, more than once, but I, re I was present when he said it once, um, Krishna consciousness is very simple. God is very great. I am very tiny. Therefore, I should serve him. That is Krishna consciousness. Then he went on to say, many people say God is great, but how great God is that they do not know. So by associating with those who know and by regularly reading Bhagavad Gita where Krishna is disclosing himself and his greatness, then one can know how great he is in comparison very tiny therefore I should serve him so hearing the quality of or the activity of hearing with eagerness from those that have that spiritual qualification then we can develop proper surrender and proper everything the spiritual conception very clearly that help? Okay, last question. Uh, my question is in, in regarding to singing these prayers that the Acharyas have written, especially Bhaktivinoda Thakur in the form of songs. Like you said, many of the, the, the songs he has written address our heart. Uh, where he says, I'm wretched, I'm fallen, I'm this, I'm that. They all appeal to me and when I sing I try to connect with that mood and offer that prayer to the Lord but usually at the last stanza he puts his own name and he says because you know Bhakti Vinod Thakur is here so that last stanza I'm not able to connect because it's not about me it's about somebody else so <laughs> <laughs> how should how sh in what mode should uh, I chant that prayer uh, you, you have a, you're, he's inviting you to have a relationship with him. That's how you should take it. Let me share this with you. I, Bhaktivinoda Thakur, am sharing this with you. I'm disclosing my heart unto you. I, Bhaktivinoda Thakur, say with all humility something. Okay, thank you all very much. Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai. Thank you very much.